So again, thank you all for being here today. I'm so excited and honored to be in the company of Ashara, Martin, Astria, and PJ this morning. We um, are a, a team of, of people who intersect in many different ways. And so uh, when I was thinking about this event, I asked myself, who, who would I want to have a physical brunch with if it were safe and possible to do so? And um, I'm really just so excited to have this, this group of people together on Zoom with you all. Um, a couple of uh, things about, about this meeting this morning. We want to just keep in mind that this is a normal Zoom meeting format. Um, so we would appreciate it if you could keep your mics, your mics on mute um, if you're not speaking so we can avoid interruptions. And we really appreciate um, if you could do that. So to kick off our meeting this morning together, I just would like to offer up a land acknowledgement and um, some background about Creative Citizens in Action so that you know what we're about and um, then we'll move into a conversation together. California College of the Arts campuses are located in Huchun and Yalamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco respectively on the unceded territories of Chechenyo and Ramatush Ohlone peoples who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, here and around the world. And we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you are joining us virtually today. If you're unsure of whose lands you're on, um, currently residing on or working on, uh, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. So a little bit about Creative Citizens in Action for, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Um, it's a college-wide initiative that promotes creative activism and democratic engagement through public programs, exhibitions, and curriculum connections. So it was actually founded in 2018. Uh, the initiative grew out of CCA's collaboration with our esteemed alumni, Hank Willis Thomas and his, um, his, his Four Freedoms, there's an entire group of, of folks though, but the Four Freedoms um, campaign during the fall 2018 semester. And um, it's constantly being expanded upon um, based on our shared desire um, as a community, CCA students, faculty, and staff to create a more connected programming, um, sent to create more connected programming that centers art, activism, social justice, democratic engagement, and uh, current events. It seems like every day something is happening. So uh, we, we have had a lot to, um, to focus on in the last couple of uh, months and years, actually. So at CCA, we've been committed to working with our faculty, staff, and students, and also elected officials to reduce barriers to student voting and uh, there will be more information that will get dropped in the chat if you're interested in learning about CCA as a voting uh, poll site. And lastly, I just want to say um, as an introduction that this program is funded by a new endowment gift to launch the Deborah and Kenneth Novak Creative Citizen Series. Um, and it's a, this, this is a part of an annual series of public programs focused again on creative activism that spans the disciplines of art, design, architecture, and writing. Um, it, it is overseen by CCA's Exhibitions and Public Programming Department in partnership with student affairs, libraries, academic divisions, communications, and faculty. So 
when I, again, when I was thinking about this virtual brunch that we're all a part of, I hope you all have your, your coffee like I do. Um, I really was uh, very, very intrigued by the fact that um, Ashara, Martin, PJ, and Astria have been working so hard online um, to, to just shine in the Bay Area. They are administrators, curators, activists. They've had significant success in transitioning their programs uh, for social distancing and just such a dynamic group of people. Um, so I, I, I want to now just, just uh, say that Again, so happy that you all are here with, with us. And I'm, I'm hoping that you can introduce yourselves. Um, give us your name, your pronouns, um, your organization uh, and affiliation, and, and any um, additional information you'd like to add about your role. And I also offered up a question to you in advance of, 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 um, of this that I would hope that you can expand on a bit, which is, uh, what singular aspect of social distancing has impacted your work the most? So we'll get we'll get started with with PJ. <laughs> Let's get started with PJ. Thank you. Hi everyone. Thank you, Sam, again for um, this invitation, and I'm so. Um, <laughs> to be in conversation with um, the panelists and everybody else um, in the, that's joining us together. Um, my name is PJ Gubatino Policarpio. I am an educator, a curator, um, and um, you know, community organizer advocate. Um, currently, I'm the manager of youth development at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, um, which includes the Young Museum and the Legion of Honor. Um, but, you know, on my own and independently, I organize, curate, and collaborate with, um, you know, artists, organizers, activists, educators, and people from um, all over. Um, yeah, I think my pronouns are he, him, his, um, and um, I don't, I'm still thinking about the big questions, so maybe we'll, we can come back to that, um, and, but I'm happy to be here. Thank you, PJ. How about Astria? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Astria Suprak. I go by she. I'm an independent artist and curator in Oakland. Uh, I'm teaching in the Museum Studies program at the University of San Francisco. And I'm currently working on exhibitions, presentations, uh, writing, video, and other projects for the Wattis Institute, Berkeley Art Center, Thatcher Gallery at USF, Caddist, and Slash Art. Um, as for your prompt, um, so I usually prepare exhibitions or presentations and physically travel them to new cities and get paid each time. Um, now that everything has been moved online, I'm worried an organization will think, well, she's already given that talk and it's accessible online. And so why pay her for, um, to present here, here? <laughs> um, which affects my livelihood. Uh, but a major advantage is that like one event can be seen by more people and with a wider reach. Um, for example, one presentation of mine was viewed a thousand times in the first weekend that it was online. Oh my goodness, wow. Um, or the first weekend, yeah. And then another event had 12 countries watching live with like people up at 4 a.m. in Shanghai ca to catch it. And others like in Australia, Costa Rica, Mexico, Italy, um, Singapore. And that obviously can't happen in, in physical space. Incredible. Thank you, Astria. Um, how about you, Ashara? Well, good morning, everyone. I am, I'm really happy to be here with you. Thank you, Sam, for inviting me for brunch. <laughs> I was thinking I'd make a mimosa, but I didn't have time. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I use she, her, and they, them pronouns. Sometimes I use Jedi as well. And uh, let's see, introducing myself is always a complicated kind of question for me, but I'm, a, I'm an independent curator, uh, occasional artist and uh, organizer. Uh, right now I'm working on a project or I've launched a new platform called Artist as First Responder. And I'm currently curating a couple of exhibitions, one with Critical Resistance and their upcoming uh, online exhibition and auction called Imagine Freedom Artworks 
for abolition. And I recently joined uh, the Museum of the African Diaspora as a forum curator for a monthly conversation that I host called Blatant, where I talk with Black women artists and creatives uh, on blatant love, joy, beauty, and rage. Regards to your question, hmm, probably travel. Uh, I was uh, slated to be at a curatorial residency at the Rebuild Foundation over the summer um, and then getting ready to be in Southeast Asia uh, this fall. So I think it's the travel piece. I, I tend to uh, work to travel and like to spend uh, time exploring different parts of the world and, and work with different artists and healers and food justice organizers, farmers and cooks as well. So I'm feeling very bound by that. And uh, I think I've gotten through the anger of it, but you know, still, that's probably been the most uh, significant aspect shift of being sheltered in place is not being able to get on a plane. Completely understandable. I yeah. feel you on that as well. Um, that's been a huge challenge. Thank you for sharing that. Um, how about you, Martin? Hi, I'm Martin Strickland, um, he, him. I am a arts administrator, curator, and hopefully like the rest of us, like Zoom expert at this point <laughs> in all, all of our lives. Um, or not, I don't know, it could go off the rails at any moment, I suppose. Um, but I am the uh, Associate Director of Public Life at YBCA. And I think that the thing that really has impacted the work that I do and that my colleagues do from an institutional point is to not be in the space, is to figure out how to do, how to do and think and feel through the work without actually kind of having a physical space to either invite people in to come and see or to gather or to talk, which is um, just the things that we thought about in our daily life, um, like so much was just like, all right, how are we going to do it? And what space are we going to do it? And um, that's been an interesting sort of shift over the past few months. Um, and one that I'll talk about a little bit uh, later in the, in the conversation. But thank you, Sam, for having us all here. This is really exciting. And it's nice to see a bunch of uh, people in the room that I know. Yes, thank you, Martin. Um, so th at this point in the, in, in the conversation, we're going to shift a little bit. And I do want to acknowledge that, unfortunately, we are not able to have um, a student representative from the Working Class uh, BIPOC grant campaign with us um, this morning because they um, have to work. Um, but I will later on in the uh, conversation acknowledge um, the, the amazing work that they've been doing. Um, so. As a part of this conversation, I wanted to ask these amazing folks about the work that they've been doing during the pandemic and about some of the intersections that we, uh, between, between us and sort of a lot of questions, common questions that have been coming up across the board that um, you all as audience members and certainly um, us as panelists have been grappling with this entire time. And so I, I wonder if we can just, um, invite uh, the panelists to begin to speak about um, their projects and their platforms and their experience over the past seven months or so uh, since shelter in place began um, in, in March. So we'll start with Martin. So, you know, I think like the rest of us, probably in this room, there's a, we have a million different things that we're doing every day um, that we're thinking about. And um, I'm going to talk about specifically the um, partnership and the art and civic experience that, y, that YBCA was, was and is presenting called Come to Your Census, Who, Who Counts in America? And I'll take it back um, a little bit before Shelter in Place. We, um, y, YBCA partnered with um, an organization called Art in Action, who was funded through the Office of Civic Engagement and Immigrant Affairs um, to promote, educate, and ensure that people had a safe um, and educated way to participate and take the census, um, specifically through art. And um, it's run by a fabulous woman named Amy Kish and supported by an equally fabulous um, woman named Brittany Finken. 
they um, had come to YBCA um, to partner with us. They were incubated, they existed in our space, although they did a number of sort of outside uh, public media cam campaigns. They were doing so many amazing things. I would um, advise everyone to go to their website, come to your census.us. Um, but part of one of the sort of physical manifestations of our partnership was going to be um, this art and civic experience that we're gonna be housed at YBCA. And when I say art and civic experience, um, we wanted to think about our gallery spaces past the traditional, oh, you get a ticket, you go in and see art, you look at a label on the wall, and then you leave. Um, we wanted it to be, um, first of all, we were going to not have any admission fees, um, and we, we had worked to pull the um, artwork sort of outside of the galleries. And when I say we, um, that I think was sort of the most interesting part, I have to say, in my career so far. Um, so it was Amy and Brittany, myself, my coworker Sarah Cathers, and two um, two amazing people. One of which is here today, Ashara Ekendayo and Candice Candice Huey, um, who made up a curatorial committee. So we sat down and went through and selected all of the artists that were going to be featured. Um, worked with them to, you know, help make their presentations possible. And we also wanted to create an experience where people could come in with their families. There was not gonna be any barriers for, um, you know, financials for, so there was no, ad, no admission fee. We were going to um, have census taking stations actually in our lobby and in our, in our gallery. So that as you were sort of looking and contemplating the art, you would be able to take the census and I think this is I was thinking about this a lot last night and this and this morning and I think it's something that a lot of us in this sort of virtual room can relate to as artists curators writers educators you have a date in your mind where you're sort of barreling towards it and you're like this is going to be you know this is where we're going to debut it for the public and this is how it's going to go and in the back of your mind you always sort of think what if we never get there what if what if what if it doesn't happen and then you know it always does happen you're always sort of at the opening or you know whatever and saying oh i never thought we'd get here and in the case of come to your census it didn't happen we were um we were still had about eight days left of install where we were going to have um, a public opening i believe on march 29th or 31st i can't remember the exact date at this point now because it doesn't matter um but when we went into shelter in place um on march 13th um i was reflecting in this morning and thinking that i I, I, I was so sort of singularly focused on getting the project done that I didn't actually, it took about a week or two for like the whole shelter in place to actually sink in, meaning that we were not going to go back in and finish what we had been working so hard to do. And we had to sort of take that time and think about pivoting. And if I knew in March how much I would be saying pivot over the next seven months, I might have found another word. Um, but uh, yeah, we all decided that we were, had, that we had to work in our homes um, for really good reason. And so we sort of sat down and thought, how can we still make an impact? How can we still honor the work that the artists um, had worked so hard to put on? And most importantly, how do we drive awareness for um, as much participation as possible for the 2020 census? And we were able to do that in a lot of really great ways. We um, sort of looked to what the what what resources did we have? What and when I when I say we, I mean the inst the institution YBCA. We had social media and we had a website. What could we do with that? How could we engage the artists? And I, and I want to be really specific here about like not, I think that the first thing that we were all thinking of was 
we knew that we had to ask the artist to do additional work and we were not going to ask the artist to do it for free. So there was a lot of work on the back end to say like, this is a budget that we were going to spend on X, Y, or Z. That's not happening anymore. So if we are asking people in a time of great stress, like let's pay people for any of the work that they are going to do um, and not in any way sort of add on that it was their obligation to further their work just because a pandemic had happened. Um, so we did a series of interviews. Um, we did a series of uh, taped conversations. Um, we asked uh, artists to record themselves. Um, many, many artists are bilingual, so we asked them to record in various languages why it was important for them to take the census and encouraging others in their community and their friends and family to take the census. Um, we had a number of Instagram live uh, com conversations and, you know, it wasn't like a plan, right? We were just sort of building this um, as we, we were sort of like flying the plane as we build it or whatever other terrible metaphor everyone's been using. <laughs> um, and we were, we were really reacting to it and, 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 and something that Ashara um, will talk about and that really stuck with me, um, which is this notion of artist as first responder. Um, the Monday after shelter in place happened, I got a text from Takashi Moro. Takashi Moro is a artist and educator and was part of a group who was presenting a work called Breaking Ice, um, which was looking at the US citizenship um, test and reimagining the hundred questions that are on there. So the work in a, in a physical space um, has the work on a wall and you go up and you look at a card and then there are other blank cards in front of it that you would answer and then put the answer, your answer in front of the card with the question and over time it builds and other people who come in and see it will be able to sort of like get inspiration from it and build upon that. Um, he texted me the like Monday after and said, how are you doing? I know that I know what this means. I know we're not gonna, that no one's gonna be able to see our work in a, in a physical space. Let's talk, what, what can we do? How can we solve towards this problem? And um, everyone in this collective was really amazing. And in about a week and a half, they had completely rebuilt the 100 questions to a website and translated it into four language, languages so that we could put that on our website as this interactive piece that had these really amazing questions of um, that were rigorous, that were hopeful, um, that were really, really, in, um, really, really interesting and inspirational and something that, you know, I feel like Ashara will talk about a little bit is that artists are always the first ones in crisis to offer a solution and that was absolutely the case and if we had not spent the time before all of this happened um building relationships with these artists like none of the success that followed would 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 have happened so you know sam i know i'm not talking specifically about sort of the works i mean we had great success in um doing a bunch of digital work, but it was really because of the sort of ingenuity and the um, just the sort of like can do attitude of the artists in our community that yeah. made all of that possible. And so I feel like that our success, yes, we have success with in a digital space, but we have success mainly because um, the artists were so willing to sort of go there, go there with us. That's incredible, Martin. Thank you so much. I mean, I I was a witness to a lot of the success and um, also a, a, a participant in some of the programming that YBCA w was putting out in response to this crisis. So um, really incredible work. And, and I do want to um, uh, just say that your work with Ashara is what brought me into the mix. So Ashara, um, we're, we're going to now move into um, your projects and platforms that have some overlap with Martin's, but um, what have you been up to? Well, I'm glad you asked, Professor Werner. <laughs> <Lerner. laughs> 
you know, when this, this shelter in place, you know, began, I was, you know, kind of struck and depressed and shocked and sad and everything. And, um, you know, like many people kind of ran to the grocery store and just kind of like got a lot of things, you know, around me. And then, you know, after about, I think the month, the first month, it was like, hmm, um, what is happening right here? There's all of this opportunity that's unfolding. So, and things that are unfolding that I had not um, had access to or had not been invited to beforehand. And I thought, well, this is a strange kind of thing. Um, you know, and then as the weeks moved on this uh, global uprising, this call to uh, honor uh, Black lives and uh, the call to, you know, step into the street, you know, at the same time that people were grappling with how to stay in and how to stay safe and who was being affected by this coronavirus and COVID-19, um, I all of a sudden became really busy. <laughs> so what I want to show you for the, the next couple of minutes is kind of a, a trajectory be, before, you know, when I had physical brick and mortar space, I was um, stewarding a container in downtown Oakland called Ashara Ekundayo Gallery. It was uh, at that time touted as the only commercial gallery in the United States that was not a nonprofit, you know, a commercial gallery that exclusively exhibited the work of Black women. So I'm going to show that video. Uh, let's see here, how to do these things. And as Ashara is uh, beginning to share her screen, I just want to encourage you all, if you have um, any questions on your mind, um, feel free to drop them into the chat and we will be able to address them at different points uh, in, in, within the hour. Okay. Can you all see this? Yes. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? Um, it's a little low, but we can hear it, I think. I am the curator owner of Ashara Ikudayo Gallery here in Oakland, California. This is a space dedicated to the exclusive experience of the African woman, women of the African diaspora, black women, American African women, women from all over the world. Ashara, raise the volume. Is, you know, maybe the fifth iteration of the Black Woman is God for, for this particular year. I'm honored to be able to hold space with my sisters for us to teach each other. I'm learning so much from the artists around how to have this kind of gallery. My name is Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle and I am an artist in um, The Black Woman is God. I make work about the persistent erasure of Black um, woman X. It was really, really powerful to show at a, a Shara private space because my work has never been in a context where it's solely about Black femme subjectivity in this really interesting and powerful context. I mean, we just did the procession and marching down the streets of Oakland. <laughs> So much of the conversation around Black folks, around uh, the situation here in Oakland is around the struggle. All power to the people and, you know, this stuff all the time. And in the midst of that, there is joy. And there has to be joy. That has to be part of our movement building, our movement making, our art making, uh, our creative genius. I love this video, Ashar. It's beautiful and so many familiar faces. Thank you for showing that. Yeah, Let's see if I can figure out how to um, stop this one and talk a little bit about so this this trajectory uh, towards blatant uh, this conversation that is also about joy um, is about the the centering of the stories of of black people and my work as a, as a feminist, as a radical black feminist is uh, rooted in that tradition. And so there's also been, um, you know, my own kind of like inquiry around how to make things, 
you know, sometimes when you are the curator and you're the gallerist, there's this, this tension uh, between the, the artists that you're, that you're exhibiting because, you know, your career and, and your um, financial stability is based on the creative practice and the labor of someone else. And so that kind of conversation gets very sticky. Um, it, and it gets complicated, you know, in a lot of ways. And so uh, let's see if I can go to this next piece. So many things around this technology, right? Let's see here. Yeah, we're, we're all learning together. <laughs> it's just like, one day I'm going to learn how to work. Yeah, it's like one day I'm going to learn how to work a Zoom. <laughs> uh, let's see. And maybe y'all can walk me through it because it seems that I have a screen that has disappeared. Okay, let's try it again. Let's just there we go. Well, what I don't want to do is show the next. Ah, okay. So we, we are seeing your screen now, yeah. I got it, I got it, I got it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so this, this exploration towards making, this is something that has happened during uh, Shelter in Place, is that I started unfolding this idea that I was going to be writing a book for 2020 called Artist as First Responder. And um, I really couldn't get that done. I couldn't start to wrap my head around that, but I, I could start to wrap my head around talking with my friends, my colleagues and comrades around the world, uh, around their stories and what I have been witnessing. And so the idea around artists as first responder, my premise is that over these three decades of, of witnessing people, witnessing artists showing up first, um, this idea that, uh, that it's not really an idea, it's, it's a reality of witnessing that artists did not stop working when the pandemic began, that uh, artists are essential workers and that we continue to show up. And so I started putting together a zine idea, you know, kind of in the tradition of scrappy and self, you know, self done and DIY. So I will, um, I'll drop the link to this page in, but I did a little fundraising and uh, interviewed some artists, my friend Sonia Renee Taylor, uh, local photographers, Adrian Wahid, Amsterdam-based DJ, you know, Lene Denise, uh, Jessica Care Moore, my poet comrade from my hometown of Detroit, Michigan. So spells, recipes, digital art, music, dance, a uh, collective called House Full of Black Women um, also. And then uh, one of our abolitionists who works with uh, women, girls, fam who are being sex trafficked uh, called Regina Evans and, how, and her project called Beloved and Insistent. So in this zine, there's, you know, there are things to read. There are QR codes. They actually work on the screen. Like if I were to enlarge this and you held your phone up to it, it would take you to the interview as well. Um, and so, you know, we printed a limited edition because, you know, the gallerist in me wants to make sure that there is ephemera and something, you know, that you can collect. Um, but you can download it for free and listen to the music. So I just wanted to um, explore this idea of making something as well as I, you know, was like, okay, we're, we're sheltering in place. What, what can you do with that? Right. Um, and that touches on this ongoing conversation that I've been hosting now for three months with the Museum of the African Diaspora, which actually was birthed from the come to your senses conversations that Martin referred to. Uh, we held a two-part conversation called See Black Women, where I interviewed eight uh, other Black women on uh, their practice, on their work, and, you know, what was coming next, the kind of radical imagination of Black women. And now, uh, every month on the third Tuesday from 4 to 5.15 Pacific time, I interview two Black women. So the next edition is coming up, um, and I will be interviewing... Uh, Dr. Savannah Shange and Amara Tabor Smith. And so this is on the Museum of the African Diaspora's site. Their website is moadsf.org. Um, and October 20th is, is what will be coming up. And then the last thing I want to show you is the, the current project that I am 
uh, part of the curatorial team for, you know, my title is curator, but I have to say that I am in partnership with a pretty amazing team of uh, activist organizer revolutionaries, some of whom are creators, who are gallerists, who are artists themselves, um, but who have come together to support the work of critical resistance. And so the website, imaginefreedom.art, uh, is one way to get to it. But I wanted to just give you all a sense of this exhibition that's coming up. It launches next Wednesday. I'm gonna go to the top. The host committee um, includes people like Amy Kish, who Martin also spoke to as the, the founder of Art in Action, Calvin Williams, Wakanda Dream Lab, uh, Deanna Van Buren, who's an architect de designing justice, designing spaces, Chinyere Opara, uh, who is a professor and the provost at Mills College, Dr. Lee Rayford, who is a scholar and an activist and educator at Cal. So it's just, it kind of spans, you know, the ideas and the sector. And there are artists featured. There's upcoming cocktail hours with a uh, host committee chef, Bryant Terry. If you RSVP for it, you get the cocktail recipe video. So, you know, there's just ways in which I'm thinking about what online programming looks like. And this is a big lift. I had no idea when I took on this project in April that it was going to be as massive and intense. Um, and what I will say um, as I close out, one is, you know, go to imaginefreedom.org, please. Uh, look at the 78 artists, 78 artists, wow. including Sam Vernon. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, who, have committed, who, have committed, who have committed to uh, sharing their work and amplifying uh, the, the call to abolish the prison industrial complex to support the ongoing effort of this badass grassroots political organization co-founded by so many people, including Dr. Angela Davis and Dr. Ruthie Wilson-Gilmore. But I just want you all to take a look at that um, to reimagine you know, how we are, how we can be you know, what that means to be uh, an organizer. And, and just to, hmm, what will I say? I guess, you know, just in terms of like what we can do and what we should do uh, as creative people to expand uh, our ways of being, to create the world that we wanna be in, um, you know, and to like tap into this technology. So, you know, being online, um, is more than a notion, and we're all kind of tired of the screen. So thank you for the folks who are putting in uh, the critical resistance site to the web, to the uh, chat line. You know, feel free to send me any questions or ideas. If you want to like take a peek at the catalog, I'd be happy to show it to you. Thank you so much, Ashara. It's fantastic. So busy, and I I really appreciate all of the intersections between you and Martin. Um, I'm definitely going to uh, want to ask you more questions about your experience together, but I'm looking at the time and want to make sure that um, we're able to to uh, share the, pro the projects of Ashtray and PJ as well. So again, if you have questions about uh, any of the work that Ashar or, or Martin have mentioned so far, uh, please drop those questions in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the presentations. So Ashtray, would you um, be so kind as to share what's going on with you? Sure, I'm going to share screen. Take me a couple button clicks. Okay, so that's, let me know if that's not full screen. In. That looks great. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll spend a couple minutes um, doing an overview of the types of projects that I've worked on during the pandemic. Then I'll go more into depth on one of them, and then I'll talk about ways could be measured as a success, which was um, one of the early prompts. Um, so, hmm. okay, so the projects have ranged from a survey exhibition of art collective related tactics, which was going to take place in a physical gallery um, at USF, but we had to reconceive that entire exhibition for COVID times. Um, the new version will consist of a public art project that will be viewable in multiple storefronts in the Bayview neighborhood of San Francisco. And there will also be an online survey exhibition. I've also done presentations like this one um, on how the Asian woman body is historically rendered as either invisible or as object. 
And now during COVID times, it's hyper visible as a scapegoat and a target of xenophobia. Um, this one I'll talk more about in a minute. And then I've done projects on Instagram. This one is for Catist, uh, described as a collaborative publishing endeavor that follows a simple format. Curators pose a question and artists answer with images. Um, and this is from the Ethnocultural Art Histories Group in Montreal. Um, it's a slideshow uh, with text about racist urban legends like rat eating, uh, which is intended to paint Asian people and immigrants as filthy, diseased and uncivilized, um, rather than say like the rats themselves or a lack of access to healthcare um, or public services or not wearing your face mask during a pandemic, um, regardless of race. So this is a, a film still from Demolition Man with Sylvester Stallone. This is also part of the sci-fi project I'm working on. Um, okay, so case study, I'm going to go a little more in depth on this one program in three minutes. Uh, so Matching Minorities, Doubtful Doubles uh, is a presentation that me and my collaborators, Jen De Los Reyes and Lisa Lee did for the Common Field Convening um, earlier in the spring. Uh, this was supposed to be in Houston, Texas. The name comes from the presenter's experience of being mistaken for one another and basically any other Asian woman in the field. This presentation was on institutionalized racism and inclusion versus optics in the art world. And why was it a success? Um, we, I think, uh, we scheduled it really tightly and the pace was quick. We communicated right at the beginning how it was going to go. Um, the written description released in advance was clear. And people knew what to expect, that there was a workshop component to it. And we worked with the medium. Um, when we realized the whole thing would be moved to Zoom, like back when we were all new to Zoom in April, uh, Lisa, who had an institutional account, saw that there was a poll option. Um, I use polls and surveys in my work a lot. and thought we should totally use this, especially knowing that we would have access to a socially engaged, politically more active group of arts workers. So from this, we pulled some stunning data. Um, question number one, POC, this was before BIPOC was standard, which is not that long ago. Um, do you feel you are often tasked with educating coworkers and peers and or solving and dismantling institutionalized racism. So of the BIPOC people um, who attended this event, a whopping 93% said yes. I'll just share one other um, question. So uh, the difference between who is expected to center their work on race or identity um, and the not applicable under the first question is the white people who were um, in the, uh, in the in the poll and then two is the BIPOC um, because you it, it's a zoom poll thing where you have to answer a question okay um, so and then with the chat function we gave prompts for attendees to answer and there were so many amazing responses it became this real resource um, and that's something that can't be conveyed in recordings because in the archived video during that section it's just us presenters like looking off to the side <laughs> and occasionally like reading what's coming in and like all the action was in this live flowing conversation so afterwards we made a couple documents from that chat uh, one is tips for anti-racist allyship in the art world and the academy um, and that's a document that's a few pages long. Um, and that predates the current wave of institutional callouts, which seems normal now. The other document was racist scenarios and solutions. So these documents are downloadable online. I'll copy and paste that, um, that link into chat later. Okay, so the last section is um, some ways to measure success. Um, so how many people are watching and how many people stay watching throughout, how much interaction there is, um, like in the chat, how many DMs you get afterwards, how many likes, Instagram 
stories tagging you. Um, and I don't know how kosher it is to share other people's Instagram stories, um, but I had just learned how to reshare stories like that week during that event. Um, and this really blew me away how many people were sharing screenshots with their comments or photos of them watching us. Um, how many followers you get afterwards? Like after one event, I, uh, there's like 200 new followers on Instagram. Um, that seems wild to me. Uh, what kind of response responses you're getting? So this is totally adorable. Um, uh, quote, thanks for being folks that a baby Asian artist can look up to. Want to squeeze that person. Um, okay, so, and then this is just like, uh, something you don't get off in like drawings of yourself um, or photos of cats watching you, please. Yes. send photos of your cats watching me. I watching me present. I, uh, that's an open invitation. Okay. So love that. <laughs> um, press, which is really rare for live events. Um, I hope more um, outlets uh, cover live events. Cause that's what our life is like. Um, and then finally, in terms of what helps you pay the rent, um, what new opportunities come up where someone says that they've seen a project or a presentation of yours online and now they would like to hire you to do something else. That, that's it. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Astria. That was great. Thank you. PJ, do you want to talk to us about your projects and platforms? Sure, I'm also um, gonna share my screen. So let's see, hopefully this works. Um, I'm gonna do present. Does that work? Yes, you're, you're, you're on, thank you. Awesome, thank you. So yeah, thank you um, again for this invitation. And um, you know, it really, helped me actually think and reflect. Um, it seems like the last six months, you know, was just kind of a big blur. I left my office on March 15th, and I'm just starting to start back here in my desk again. Um, so what I wanted to do is um, share um, a few projects that I actually happened to, um, to work through d during the pandemic and during, you know, sheltered in place. Um, and and think about you know kind of some of the um, the connected threads and hopefully reflect the ethos and some of the um, you know ideologies and philosophies that I think I, I strongly com I'm committed to. So I'm just going to share that. Um, so you know um, in March you know after everybody kind of were um, sheltered in place and and kind of stuck at home, I had a few. Um, I had a few organizations, Dressel Gallery in Brooklyn um, and ICI um, reach out to me to think about, um, to share some reflections about time, that time and, and, and my work, you know, how it affected me, um, the work that I do as a, an educator, as a curator, um, or, you know, the, how the, the, the pandemic had really kind of, you know, were, um, how it affected me. And so one of the things that I wanted to think about is I actually wasn't really thinking about art or curating or organizing or talking to artists or looking at art. You know, I mean, those things are a part of, of my kind of daily life, but I really was thinking about um, people first. You know, this was the time, I think March and April, when news had come out of, um, of, um, of, you know, really, really, tragic news coming out of New York City and especially um, in Queens, you know, primarily in Elmhurst, Jackson Heights and Corona, which is where I lived, you know, kind of the daily death ray, you know, climbing death rates. And, you know, Sam, you, you and I, you know, are very close to Queens. I think we first met at the Queens Museum. Um, and yeah. so I was really thinking about that and really especially thinking about the community that I lived with, you know, this kind of, um, if you've ever been in Queens, this images of Diversity Plaza in Jackson Heights, if you've ever been in Queens, you know, you know that it's, it's this largely migrant, multilingual, working class kind of intergenerational community that comes together, you know, working, living, 
um, and this kind of, you know, world um, that really deeply impacted my practice, actually, as a curator, as an educator, um, as a person. And so I was really in mourning, you know, I was really in this kind of mourning mode, um, thinking about, you know, this space and, and how it was affecting people. Um, and one thing that was also really clear, you know, was um, in Elmhurst, you know, it was Elmhurst Hospital. And I kind of drew the connection between healthcare workers um, and how, you know, they were obviously the first responders as well, um, but also deeply impacted, you know, and I thought about um, my aunt, who was a nurse, who came to the United States as a nurse, um, you know, really to fill in that gap of the, of the nursing workforce workforce in the 70s and the idea of care and caring and and who cares for us and for the people um and so you know i was really this kind of time you know really allowed me to mourn and reflect um on my own story and my own family's journey to the united states that um you know started through this one aunt of mine who, who was an, a nurse. Um, and through that, um, so this was a writing project that I was, you know, able to write for um, ICI. Um, and, you know, and then I also, you know, was able to invite um, doc, um, Catherine Siniza Choi, who is a writer, um, a scholar from UC Berkeley, who really, you know, wrote and has wrote about um, the, 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 um, the trajectory of Filipino nurses um, in the United States. And so, you know, I really love this idea of, of you know, taking time to grieve and conform it, uh, you know, and confronting the enormity of this loss. I think I never want us to forget and I never want us to, to think that while we are being productive and while we can be and we're still working, that this, you know, loss has affected, deeply affected a lot of people. Um, and we all know disproportionately um, black, brown, indigenous communities. And so, you know, I wanted to kind of write this, um, this, you know, and share this story. Um, and so I was able to do that through these two commissions um, and hopefully, you know, shed light on this story. Um, so another work that I was able to do during the pandemic was, um, you know, work through with Art Practical, who's, you know, um, to, to host their um, Notes from Moad series. So I was able to, um, to talk to um, their three emerging artists from um, Museum of African Diaspora. Um, and this is all online, so you can find that. Um, the other thing, you know, in my day job at the, muse uh, the Fine Arts Museums, I also worked um, through, um, we had to move our teen program online. And so all of our meetings were done on Zoom. I did a, uh, I did a seven week youth program um, through, um, through Zoom, working with 10 um, teens from across, you know, um, 13 to 19, you know, years old to produce a podcast um, that kind of talks about um, selected artworks from our pers uh, from our permanent collection coming from you know our rich and and, and variety of, of collections that we have um, so each of them could really engage and share their work and share their voice um, interviews with curators with artists with scholars and other and other stakeholders on this object um, on the objects so that podcast is coming out soon um, so I'll, I'll I'll be able to share that um, with everybody. And then the last project I'll talk about um, now is actually should be launching today or, um, or in the next few hours. Um, so with Southern Exposure, where I'm currently a curatorial council member, I came up with and organized um, this um, online um, Instagram and web um, exhibition called First Made Into Language, which really thinks through, um, you know, this time of the pandemic, our def deflated economy, and, you know, the, the reckoning on race and racism. I think that it's times like this, these fraught moments that we turn to poets and, you know, poets who are really our truth tellers. And so I've invited to share, um, I've invited five poets um, queer, trans, indigenous, femme, black voices to share their works or share works that they want to share with everybody. Um, for so the next five weeks, we'll be launching and sharing one poem, one poet 
a week for the next five weeks. And so, you know, first made into language really comes out of Audre Lorde's um, defining text, poetry is not a luxury. Um, so I wanted to kind of um, hark back to that, um, you know, black feminist um, voice. Uh, the five poets that I'm working with um, are here. Um, and so they'll be sharing their work throughout the five weeks. Um, one thing that I also wanted to share was that idea of the show really came out of the need to support artists and to be able to give, um, you know, provide um, honorarium financial support. And so with Southern Exposure, we were able to, to do that, you know, and, and we asked the poets to just to give us poems or older words. It doesn't have to be new. It doesn't have to be a fresh you know, um, a fresh new work. It's just something that they want to share to the world right now. Um, and, you know, in, in order to, you know, so that we can kind of funnel in some other funds while the, the gallery is closed and, and you know, and, and move and shift our funding to, to directly support um, artists and poets in our community. Um, so it will, this will be launched, you know, online um, and also shared through social media. So this is an excerpt of Alan's poem that's going to be shared um, through Southern Exposure's um, Instagram. So, you know, um, a poem like Instructions for Perhaps the End of the World. Um, and, and, and also along with that, we ask them to share an image or a work or a picture or something that is, you know, um, that defines this moment. So this one is from um, Giselle. Um, it, and it will be paired, you know, poem and an image. Um, and so, yeah, that's it. You know, I think I really kind of really briefly went through all of these projects, but I'm happy to, to talk about them more and, and share more um, and be in conversation. So feel free to reach out. I'm going to... Thank you, CJ. Wow, um, incredible work. Um, I'm so I'm so excited by everyone's projects. You all are fantastic. I'm just so inspired by you consistently. Um, before we open up uh, the conversation to questions, both uh, questions I have of you and uh, questions that the audience may have, I, I do want to take a moment to read this, a, a statement um, provided by the students um, of the uh, Working Class BIPOC grant campaign. Creativity takes courage. Courage takes community. Students in solidarity with their working class BIPOC classmates. On behalf of the 24 Frames Animation Club, the Black Brilliance Club, the Students of Color Coalition, Student Council, and Student Union of California College of the Arts, we ask for your donations to support our working class and BIPOC classmates. We've teamed up to catalyze the change necessary to make our school viable for all of its students. The astronomical cost of living in the Bay Area, combined with the annual tuition of over $50,000, makes it nearly insurmountable for many to attend, let alone thrive at CCA. Black, Indigenous, and students of color make up about 4% of the student body an unacceptable disconnect between higher education and the BIPOC artist community in the Bay Area. During this time of COVID and a global Black Lives Matter civil rights movement, these students are particularly vulnerable. With your help, we can remove some of the hurdles they face in meeting, in meeting their living expenses and buying art supplies. All proceeds will go towards unrestricted grants to working class and BIPOC students to meet their most pressing needs to remain in school. Our goal is to provide a grant to every qualified student that applies. The arts have always been closely intertwined with social change and are vital for community engagement through sharing information, envisioning a peaceful and just society, and most importantly, humanizing voices and fears that are often unheard. Creativity takes courage and courage takes community. Be part of the community these students need to be seen in the most visibly vibrant way possible and support our effort. Thank you. So I will, um, I will, I'm happy to uh, put uh, the link to their GoFundMe um, in the chat or um, Jamie, if you don't mind helping me out with that, that would be amazing. 
Um, I, I just want to acknowledge that, again, um, we did not have the students with us today because they were working. <laughs> um, they're currently working. So I um, just want to give a shout out to the many, many students of the CCA community who are involved um, in that effort. And um, please donate if, if you can. OK, great. So aligned with the statement that the students provided, I, I just want to talk about equity. Equity has come up a lot um, in all of the presentations, uh, whether it be through polls and surveys, as Astria was pointing out, or um, PJ having you having to kind of go online and do a seven week program with teenagers, okay? <laughs> I can't imagine how, how that must have been. Um, and then um, Martin, uh, you, you, you know, having to, to definitely um, think, think about census taking stations, um, moving onto an online platform and, and what you could do with social media. Of course, Ashara too, um, doing a lot on social media and, and creating an, an entire series for folks to tune into. So I'm, I'm wondering, we've talked a lot about, but, uh, about what worked, like what was the success, but I, I wonder if you could um, be vulnerable enough to share what didn't work. <laughs> like, what would you, what would, what, what, what would you do differently, um, all things considered? And, and I, that's open to, to all of you, if, if any of you want to jump in on that. I'll take a stab at this. I think that we, um, when, you're, when you're talking about sort of metrics, metrics of success, so posting something online versus getting people to read it or engage with it or experience it, um, you know, something that we found, uh, you know, that, you know, if we had it to do over again, I think that some of maybe the interviews, so um, for the Come to Your Census work, we were doing um, individual interviews with artists to sort of further explore their practice. And then we were doing a series of what we were calling nine questions. We would ask the same, uh, the, we would ask the artists the same nine questions and get different responses to it and sort of build that around. Um, what we were noticing is that when we would post those on to social media, we might get a like, but that wouldn't necessarily translate into like a click or a view into like the website. So really thinking about how you are disseminating information in a digital space um, is something that I feel like we learned a lot about. Um, throughout this process. So we might not have been successful in the initial sort of transfer of putting the work out into the world versus getting people to see it. And it's something that we're continuing to think about. Thank you, Martin. Would anyone else like to weigh in on that? I think um, I can talk about our program and, and moving things um, online. I think there are a lot of, you know, definitely logistical questions and, 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 you know, issues that could happen. I think the one thing that I learned, you know, with our program was having three hours of like Zoom face-to-face -face was really, really tough and it actually really um, drained um, everyone's energy. And so to ask that, um, especially for our, our teens was really, really hard, but, you know, we, we pushed through it, we, we split them up. Um, so that it's an hour and a half in the morning and then an hour and a half in the afternoon. So there's ways that we could, we kind of anticipated and planned for it. But I think overall, um, it's definitely not, you know, ideal. I think that a big part of my work has really been to bring people together in the same space, um, you know, kind of physical space. And so, you know, I think that is, you know, one way, you, you know, the pivots were kind of worked for the time you know that we're, we're in but i'm really hoping to 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 gather together soon but i'm yeah i think that you know finding you know and building community even through virtually even online i think we we did a lot of work to to kind of gain that kind of collective trust and 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 and, and efforts um and then on the other projects i think um you know generally i think um it's not i think i find it what I find most successful about my projects um, is, you know, really when I try to, when, you know, you shift or reframe um, 
ideas and conversations and and um and um you know and i think that when you offer something new i think that that to me is more more successful than kind of the you know i don't know like the audience or or, or the people or other kinds of metrics so i think that um being a, there's many different ways that that could be used thank you ashara um you know i was thinking there was there was a project that i was a uh, lead strategist on with the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts uh, called the Artist Power Center. And one of the, one of the goals um, in, in my scope of work was to, you know, invite and hopefully invigorate uh, creatives around the country to talk about what mutual aid is, what it meant, what relational aid is, uh, how we incorporate the idea of um, gifting each other and being generous with, with each other. I'll put the, the link uh, to the site there because there, the resources are there on demand. Right now, maybe Martin, you can speak a little bit about it as well. But the thing that didn't work for me was really trying to, in, I, I think, invite, encourage artists who were exhausted and um, terrified at the same time to produce to write, to blog, to think, um, to be creative and effervescent in that, and to want to engage each other. I mean, we were all really, and continue to be um, exhausted. And so um, I had no idea how much time it was going to take and how much psychic blood, honestly, it was going to take to really um, get artists to be able to, to touch into this, to tap into it, to access it, to use it. And so I think something I would have done differently as a, as a consultant on the project um, would have been maybe to take some more time with it. it. It launched very quickly, it dropped very quickly, and we all had to run. And running is, is not really what was needed at the time. Um, even though there was this, this call, obviously people were struggling and um, rent needed to be paid. And there were literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people applying for $100 and $200 mutual aid fund grants. Right. right. But it, we needed to take a breath and slow down. Um, so I, I would have done that differently for myself and I would have encouraged uh, my client to just, we can, we can slow down a little bit. Thank you. Thank you for that, that honesty, Ashara. Um, Astrea, I just was wondering if you wanted to chime in. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, that rush, that expectation, um, that demand that you be timely, that you respond to the moment um, is like it cuts both ways. I mean, it's we <laughs> a lot of us are like on top of all like all the news, all the shit happening in our personal lives um, at work, etc. Um, and have thoughts about all these things, but um, like churning out something well written, uh, well considered, well produced, um, well designed, whatever, like being able to do that um, on demand, I, that, yeah, that's really hard. And that's also like uh, a white supremacy culture <laughs> um, to expect immediate good production. Um, so, I've been really appreciating the uh, proposals um, or requests from me that are pretty open-ended and maybe even have like loose schedules or like, you know, are where the person um, requesting things of me is very open to things moving. Um, and I'm feeling lucky that some of the people I'm working with right now are like that are, yeah. Um, and then as a viewer <laughs> of many of these events, um, I just want to say like the timing is something that really affects how uh, engaged I'm able to be. Like, um, you know, there's some hours that I really need to be working and doing other things and I'm like half paying attention to something that would probably be really amazing and change my life, but I just, I can't, I have other things that I have to do. So the recordings help, but as I had said earlier, like there's, there's also disadvantages to that. 
Thank you, Astria. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really appreciate all of this because um, we all have been online a ton lately. Um, and, and so um, I, I want to acknowledge th that I recently saw Ashara and Martin ma wearing masks going through um, YBCA's exhibition in the same space and um, doing an IG live together. So as things are opening back up and we're beginning to understand that we can socially distance in the same space and talk about art together, what are, um, what are some of the things that feel personally for you all in your projects that are opening up a bit? Or does, do things feel like they're, like, like, like they're shifting into not normalcy, but um, a bit more of a, a space where we can come to come together. Um, what was that experience like for, for you, Ashar and Martin, to get that started? Well, Martin had invited uh, myself and Amy and Brittany to, uh, I think, come and talk. I, I think, well, to come and visit the exhibition as it was being the installed. As, as he mentioned, please chime in here, Martin. <laughs> you know, there, were another, there was another week or so before the exhibition was going to be fully installed. And then all of the months passed and it needed to be deinstalled. And so we never got to see the entire thing. But I, I, I hadn't, I had only come to San Francisco. I live in Oakland. I'd only come to San Francisco twice in those six months. And so it was my, my second time across the, across the bay. And it was like, so wonderful to like walk into a museum. It was so fabulous to like be in this large space and see this work in front of me that I'd only been looking at, you know, on the screen. So I just turned on Instagram. <laughs> I was like, come on curator, walk me through it. Let's, let's go. We had a lot of views on it. So I'm glad you got to watch it. Martin, what do you, what do you think about, you know? Yeah, we, that was, that was super. Simultaneous. Fun. It was just That fun. was great. Yeah. I mean, you just turned on the phone and we were just like doing it. Um, I think that, I think that that sort of answers or goes into a little bit um, of what success in this time can look like, you know, the, 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 themes that come to your census are bound by bureaucracy. They are bound by the court's decision. Um, they are bound by the Trump's administration's decision to move back the date to move. Well, the, the original census, right, was supposed to go through July 31st. It was moved to October 31st and then mm -hmm. back to September 30th. So as we were looking at what we were presenting in our gallery spaces versus what the, um, rules were from the city for reopening indoor exhibition spaces on top of a lot of other things it was just it just was not feasible for us to leave something up without knowing like what we could do about it so it was thinking how do we honor the work that was done by everyone and that was coming in and um, staging works that had not been fully installed to do high-res installation shots, both for YBCA and for all of the artists. And then it was inviting all of the members of the curatorial committee to come in and make a video um, about all of this to tell the sort of full story um, of it. And then they'll also, <clears throat> excuse me, there'll also be a long form um, essay about it that we're all going to be writing. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was just really fun to be back in and kind of nerd out about a bunch of really fabulous art that we both, you know, it only existed in our mind, right? Like, I mean, it does exist in a physical space, but it was cool to sort of like walk back through it again. And I think that that was something that Ashar and I were talking about at the end of the day was, oh, this was like a feeling of like getting back to a little bit of normalcy, even though like the next day, right? Like, YBCA was closed and were not open to the public, but it was a, this little sort of glimpse and to sort of what we could do. Yes, and you have until September 30th, every, everyone, if you have not filled out the census already, to fill out the census, please, please do so. Um, yeah, it was great to see you all in the same space and, and, and to also acknowledge all of the hard work um, that you put into that show, so thank you. 
Um, PJ, I also see that um, you have been going and seeing sh shows in, 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 in physical galleries because we, we were friends, we follow each other on Instagram. Um, how has it been for you? Um, well, I've only, I, you know, it's, it's still, it's really, I, I went to see one show. I went to see Carlos Villa's show at um, Minnesota Street. Um, I think because I really wanted to um, to see the work and working on a project, um, you know, upcoming for that um, monograph. But I think, and I, you know, obviously I work at a museum. The museum is now open here. The De Young, at least, is open, and we've slowly, you know, hopefully, safely bringing in people together. Um, but it's definitely. I think I had. I didn't have a rush. Um, you know, I. I really. I. Th I think for me, <laughs> looking at art and going to to shows are kind of really um, an intuitive thing. So usually my idea is, you know, before the pandemic, you know, I list out things that I want to see, and then when I feel like it, I carve out time and, and space. So if I don't end up going, it's fine. Um, but now with all of the um, the advanced registrations and the, the and you know the RSVPs, it's a little overwhelming for me. So I, I hate typing. You know, even though it's so easy, I kind of hate pre-registering. So that kind of is lost for me. You know, this sense of like, oh, it's a nice afternoon. I want to see something, I can just walk in. So I kind of mourn that a little. Um, but I, I think to, to kind of just respond to um, Astria's earlier thought, I think that, you know, being asked, um, you know, to do things, and, and, and I'm really surprised that I, I can actually be more productive. It did feel like it was actually, I've been actually more productive than usual um, with a lot of requests and commissions and projects. Um, but I think, you know, I think that, you know, I think being able to reflect publicly, um, and kind of resist this idea of everything is finished, everything is, um, clean and done and, and well-designed and, and ready is, is really exhausting. Um, and so I really appreciated being able to share, um, you know, thoughts and ideas and, and feelings, you know, which isn't usually what people want to hear or feel or, you know, everything has to be in this kind of art, art context. Um, and so to be able to kind of think about, you know, emotions and feelings and people um, has also been really great. And, and you know, and I've, um, you know, for, for the projects that I've talked about, you know, I've, I've centered those um, emotions and feelings um, and I've been able to fortunately, you know, ask people to share, you know, like, I know you want me to write about this, but this is actually what I, I want, I, I'm feeling, you know, I feel the need to publicly mourn and grieve these lives and how can we honor that and, and, and you know, and, and so to center that and to prioritize that and, and you know, and so you know, it's great when opportunities can kind of re honor that as well. So just want to put it out there. It's like nothing is so clean and perfect and we're all on different timelines. Thank you, PJ. And just, um, I, I just want to um, acknowledge that the D Young Yes is open and it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the show that's going to be installed and coming up is representative of Bay Area artists, correct? Yes. Yeah, so right now um, our the Frida Kahlo exhibition, which was supposed to open in March, just uh, on the weekend when, you know, sh Shelter in Place was announced, is open. I um, mean, in, in the next couple of weeks, we should be opening the De Young Open, which is a survey of Bay Area artists and artworks. Um, you know, I think we have over 800 um, wow. artworks by maybe 700 Bay Area, area artists. Wow. Uh, thematically and throughout our, our gallery. So we're really excited to welcome everybody to that show and, and to see Bay Area artists and Bay Area art. So hopefully in a couple of weeks, um, the announcement will be out or the opening. Thank you. And then the last question I have is actually for Astria because Astria, I, I really admire your, um, your sort of uh, commentary and critique of, of, of the Zoom um, events that I that I see that I, you know you you are so active and actually like attending these things and and 
sort of uh, reflecting on them and giving your feedback. And so um, I, I kind of look to you for, for the best ofs. Um, I'm wondering if you can share what, what, your, what you feel is kind of the best of uh, programming that you've seen on, on Zoom or online so that we can check it out. <laughs> yeah, um, William Pope L. Yes. Everybody <laughs> from Monday, so uh, September 22nd. Um, UC Berkeley lecture series um, that unfortunately it'll only be f uh, like a 15 minute video recording that will be placed online. That's I think what they said. Um, I mean, hopefully he, if he, if he performs or I think it was even billed as like a lecture or a talk <laughs> and it was a straight out like performance for the zoom camera. And uh, yeah, that was amazing. Um, see anything that, uh, Popel does live. Um, another thing that I enjoyed was um, a an event through the new school that was part of their protocols series. Um, there is a uh, like performance video thing from Jesse Chun in New York, um, and the other the other people presenting um, had really great things to um, contribute as well. I mean, just what they're researching, what they're talking about. So something, something, something protocols, new school, <laughs> Jesse Chun, C-H-U-N, um, as well. I, I wish I uh, had uh, the other presenters' names on the tip of my tongue, but you'll, you can find that. That was maybe two, three weeks ago. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a, a couple of minutes um, to open it up to our audience members. If you want to unmute and ask a question of the entire um, group or one person in particular, now would, now would be the time for that. And we, we do hope that you have some, some questions or comments. I'm looking through here. I see so many friends. Hi, Camille. <laughs> Any questions for the group? There's a question from Jamie in the chat. Okay, Jamie, let's see. So the question is, yes, I actually have this question too. There's been a lot of talk of psychic exhaustion how do you recharge or practice self-care in, in this moment? I can, um, I guess I can start. Um, you know, I think the opportunity of, of joining Zoom conversations and panels and, you know, there, there's been so many um, was really exciting. But honestly, after maybe july at the end of july or august i like just stopped going so other than this one i haven't been on any zoom conversations um, thank you for coming to this one pj yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um i just feel like i mean it's so rich and but i you know i i really need to i need to protect um myself um as well but also you know the news and, and i try to step away um from them um and really i don't know i've i've taken back my full weekends which i'm you know it it feels weird because i've been working from home so kind of the delineation between the work time and and professional time and home time um you know has really been kind of muddled but i think since moving um work working from home um i've really been conscious to to take the weekends, uh, you know, no work emails, no work news, no work related things and art related things, unless it's things that I am committed to or, or I'm interested in or friends that I care deeply about. But even, even if a friend is presenting, I probably won't be attending. I'm sorry if you are here. <laughs> no, you, have, you, have to, you have to protect your time, protect your energy. Thank you, PJ. And other thoughts? Um, go ahead. Mm. I, I was going to say that because the days and the evenings have muddled together and the, the work time and the home time is blurred, uh, I had to remember to return to my date night with my partner. Actually, like, it's Friday. 
at seven o'clock is date night. Also that I take a day that I don't deal with my clients. You know, it's like, I, I know there's deadlines. I know we're busy. I know we're all in a rush and everybody thinks that we're all performing at a very high level back to pre, pre shelter in place um, work. But there is a day where I do my artwork, you know? And then the other thing is to sleep, you know, to make myself go to sleep, you know, which means that I have to, you know, take herbs and, you know, I've started taking CBD to go to sleep and it's like, I have to go to sleep because my brain wants to keep working. And then the other thing is that I don't work in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, you work all over the house, you work all the time every day. And it's like, I do not work in my bedroom. My bedroom is my sanctuary to dream. And my dream time is how I work on my own reality, you know? So those are some of the things that I've been doing. I love that. Thank you, Ashara. Astria? Yeah, I was going to say a few things. Um, fair pay. Uh, like trying to only say yes to things that are compensating your time fairly. And for events and presentations like this, like it's not just the one, two hours that we're on. It's like all the prep in advance. And if someone wants like a brand new lecture or like tailoring something to their class, like that needs to be worth my time and um, everyone else's that you're asking. Um, being comfortable in your home. Uh, like one thing that I got recently for myself was a plant dolly, um, like a little cart on wheels that you're, you can like move plants on, but like putting whatever you're like moving from room to room, <laughs> like your one fan in the house during a heat wave or air purifier or whatever, like that was, um, a nice little like treat. Yes, yes, thank you. Martin, any thoughts? Uh, I agree with everyone. I try to do, I feel like all of that. Um, in the beginning, and it's just something that I've like continued to do is that I like naturally get up really early, but decided like to try to really not take any meetings or do anything if possible until about 10. Um, and I don't know. I just like, I just like go on really long walks every morning, like explore mm -hmm. different parts of the city, like listen to music, not listen to music, check out points of interest or not just to kind of like go, go around, like, you know, started walking around the Presidio a lot in like the early days of this. And I was like, well, shit, this is really lovely. This is great. Yeah. This is yeah. a great way to sort of start the day. Um, so but what I think I really mean by that is to like recognize that we're working in a completely different way. So we should start our days or end our days in completely different ways that mirror sort of the different kinds of stress that we're under. Can I tack on that as like a reason to not have Zoom events or other public events like before 11 a.m.? especially with the interrupted sleeping um, and all that and preparing to be. Yes. Tired. Yes. Um, all things considered, we're also working on, some of us are working on a global platform right now. Um, I'm a, I'm an educator and having students in, in my zoom classes that are in Beijing or um, in Sydney or in other places of the world, we are really trying to figure out this time different situation, right? Um, and, and making it um, equitable and um, uh, f figure out how uh, as many people as possible can, can, can attend. So these are all great things. Personally, I have turned my notifications off as, uh, for emails <laughs> as of uh, last week. So that is something that I've done to, to, to sort of um, address this after watching the social dilemma on Netflix, I'm like, okay, the addiction is real. I need to put this, this thing down and, and not feel like I have to re respond every single time. But anyway, that's, that's my personal um, advice to the group. But speaking of time, we've reached uh, 1230. So I want to respect everyone's time and energy. Thank you so, 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 so much. Uh, PJ, Ashara, Martin, and Astria for being a part of this event. And I also want to acknowledge the work of, of, of the students as well at CCA for the Working Class BIPOC grant campaign. Thank you all uh, for being here. Um, it, yes, class. <laughs>
Yes, yes. Um, uh, please uh, follow all of the links in the, in the chat if you want for more information. Um, look into the chat, copy and paste it uh, if you if you if you can. And um, if anything comes up, you can reach me uh, if you want more information about anything that was discussed. Sam Vernon at cca.edu. Okay. I hope everyone has a fantastic rest of your Wednesday. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.